everybody has a right to live safely in their community. If you suspect that someone is being harmed or mistreated in some way, don't ignore it. Report it. The Surrey Safeguarding Adults Board is a partnership of key local agencies across the county working together to keep the most vulnerable people in Surrey safe in their homes and where they live. Contact details will be provided at the end of this film. Though actors and false identities have been used in the making of this film, the accounts given are based on the lives of real people. I sold my house to pay for the fees and I put Julia, my daughter, in charge of my money. She's good at that sort of thing. She's an office manager. Annie is 81. She has lived in a care home for the last three years. Anyway, we chose this place and this was nice and I moved in. Uh, and at first, everybody comes to see you and... That's nice. It's like you're the queen. The whole place is buzzing. But, of course, naturally, they're busy and they haven't got time to come and see you again. But Julia always came. And then she brought Neil. She said he was her boyfriend. Her boyfriend? He's 54. Anyway, he had a smile that didn't reach his eyes. And it didn't convince me at all. But I couldn't tell her that, could I? Over time, Julia and Neil became Annie's only visitors. Every time they come into my room, he closes the door, quiet. He holds the handle and gently shuts it so no one can hear. And he gives me that smile, the one where his eyes say something else. And he talks about how his business is having cash flow problems. The care home staff noticed some unexplained bruising on Annie's arms. He would take my arm and hold it really tight. He'd press his thumbs in, lead me over to my dressing table and make me sign bits of paper and cheques. Though Annie's care home bills were always paid on time, the staff eventually noticed that she had some unexpected financial difficulties. Every Wednesday, the care home would arrange a wheelchair and my friend Christine would take me into town. We'd have a sandwich and a coffee and then she'd take me shopping and I'd buy a lipstick. I like the bolder ones, you know, deep cherry or violet shimmer. But when I had no money in my purse, I couldn't go. The care home managers and staff were concerned and contacted the social care practitioner. This woman called Amanda from social care came to visit me and asked me how things were for me living at the home. I didn't tell her anything at first. I thought it was someone just being nosy. But then I could tell she was interested in me. So I explained about Neil and the bruising and jewellery and signing things and money and not having any new lipsticks. Annie's case was considered under the Surrey Safeguarding Adult Procedures. The police undertook an investigation and staff from Adult Social Care supported Annie to tell her story. The social care workers and care home drew up a new support plan and, at Annie's request, contacted Annie's wider family and friends. Julia didn't speak to me at first, but then Neil disappeared off the scene. She went all slippery when the police appeared. Him and that smile that never touched his eyes ran off. Julia comes as often as she can and always apologises. And I'm always so pleased to see her. There was this lad at the other end of the street. I don't know what I did to upset him or what, but when he was younger, he used to come to my door, knock on it, and then run to the gate. 
and when I opened it, he'd shout and ask to want to come out and play football. He thought it was hilarious. I ignored him, he was just a kid. James is 47 and has been in a wheelchair for eight years following a road traffic accident which severely damaged his spinal cord. He is physically disabled and uses a wheelchair to get around. But as he got older, bigger, he started to hang around with some other boys that used to swagger down our road. There was trouble. They keyed a few cars. And one of them did that thing where you run over the car and jump on the roof or the bonnet. I told them once to stop early on and they ran. Another time, the police caught and cautioned them. And I suppose the, the gang thought that I'd rung the police. And I think maybe that's when it all started. James suffered a series of hate crimes from a gang of local youths. These escalated over a period of time. It began with name calling, the usual stuff. I tried to ignore it, block it out and it'll go away. I have a car that's been specially adapted and they seem to enjoy letting the tyres down on a frequent basis. It's pathetic, really. Where's the thrill in that? James maintained that the effects on him were felt even whilst there was no direct aggression towards him. What will they do next? You react to every noise on the street. You feel trapped in your own home at times. I feel that feeling, but sometimes it gets the better of you. My family and I wonder what to do about the situation, but didn't know where to start. In the end, James contacted the local adult social care team. Social services considered what had been happening to me within the Safeguarding Adults procedures and contacted other local agencies. As a result, the community police increased the patrols around my area, arranged for me to have security lighting around my house and dealt with the gang without me having to get involved. The adult social care team assessed my needs and found that I was eligible for a personal budget to help with my care and daily living needs. James's home had already been adapted, but with some of the funds he received, he was able to employ a personal assistant who, on a daily basis, could support him and carry out personal care and practical domestic chores, such as shopping or getting him to medical appointments. A neighbourhood support officer became involved in the investigation, along with the Children's Service and the Youth Justice Service. It's funny. Dealing with intimidation has eventually sort of opened things up for me. I'm more aware of what's available to me, and now, no more of my neighbours. James feels much safer in his home and local community, thanks to accessing help from various agencies in that community. All sorts of things can be done to help people in the position I was in, but you also have to do something for yourself. You have to speak up. You have to give the people who can help you a chance to help you. Don't suffer in silence. Me and my wife cried when we got the diagnosis. We made pledges how we would work through things. At the time, we believed them. Peter is 58. Six years ago, a brain tumour meant that he lost his sight and became officially registered as blind. I never said it, but in a funny way, when I was diagnosed, I felt more sorry for her than I did for me. I'd gone blind, so it was my fault. But she, well, her whole life had to change through no fault of her own. I felt bad about that. After the initial phases of changing their relationship, Peter and Angie found that life was becoming more and more difficult. 
she started to do some odd things. She would hide my cane so I couldn't leave the house and then say, look for it, go on, look for it. She would monitor my phone calls. Our house landline had an extension so she'd listen in and then she'd hide my mobile phone. Check my messages. She was angry and frustrated at me. And this is an odd thing to say, but I think she wanted to damage my life a little. Almost by totally controlling it. Peter and Angie were in a cycle that was becoming very destructive and difficult to break. The first time she hit me was actually with my cane. She'd hidden it and I shouted at her and she denied hiding it. And then she said it had been in front of me all the time and started hitting me on the legs with it, saying, here it is, here's your ruddy cane. It was around this time that Peter's family and friends started to notice unusual bruising and they felt that he had changed. We were having this argument. Can't remember what about, but I could feel she totally lost it. Then she hit me with something very solidly metal. The next thing I knew, I woke up in the hospital. Apparently she'd hit me with a saucepan right on the temple. It had cut my head open and I needed stitches. T to be fair to Angie, she called an ambulance. The couple's differences appeared irreconcilable and Peter felt divorce was inevitable. I had to find somewhere else to live. The investigations into what happened would take time. And meanwhile, life goes on. The social care team and my local borough council found me new, especially adapted accommodation. It was a difficult time, as you can imagine. But at least I had a roof over my head and some caring expert advice. There are many agencies to help people in situations such as Peter's. If you feel that you are in a similar position, take action as soon as possible. I decided to prosecute and Angie got a suspended sentence. Looking back, I'm glad she didn't go to prison. But I'm also glad that I saw the prosecution through. I felt then, and I still feel now, that everyone has the right to be safe in their own home or in their community. And I wanted to protect that right. Honour, or is that, is like the biggest thing in an Asian family. Yasmin is 19. She is doing an NVQ level two in administration at her local college. So when you're a girl in a family like mine, there are so many ways you can shame your family. Like wearing lipstick or owning a mobile phone, cutting your hair. They're all way too westernised. Yasmin has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, a mental health condition, which leaves her especially vulnerable. So, like, one day I came home from college and there were all these materials, different materials, all over the living room. And there were different, like, bright colours and pretty embroidery. My mum was folding them and putting them into a trunk. I asked her, what are these for? She said, they're for your wedding. Yasmin's mother and father had arranged a marriage for her with a man from Karachi. I was like, just shocked. My mum showed me a picture of the man they wanted me to marry. He was like, really old. I just wanted to scream. 
No way. But I couldn't. The plan had been for Yasmin to fly to Pakistan with her mother to meet and marry her husband. I was getting so worried that I couldn't do my work and I was falling behind. So my lecturer wanted to have a chat. I think she thought that we were going to talk about coursework and that, but I started telling her about why I was worried and that I didn't want to marry this man in Pakistan, and I told her everything, really. Yasmin's lecturer contacted the police, who, in turn, notified adult social care. The police led the intervention, and Yasmin was taken to a place of safety, directly from the college. My lecturer knew about this thing called safeguarding, I don't really know exactly what it is. It's like keeping me from harm. And because like there's no point in them going and telling my parents because they're just going to say yes, of course, to police and social people. But the minute they get me on my own, they're going to they're going to say I shame the family and make me marry the man anyway. Often people with mental health issues or learning disabilities aren't believed, and people tend to check their stories with the families. In doing so, they are placing that person straight back into the path of harm. I miss my mum and dad, but now I can do my course, and I can be myself, and... I can choose how I live my life. And that's the way I want it. That's the way it has to be. Everybody has a right to live safely in their community. If you suspect that someone is being harmed or mistreated in some way, don't ignore it, report it. The Surrey Safeguarding Adults Board is a partnership of key local agencies across the county, working together to keep the most vulnerable people in Surrey safe in their homes and where they live. Contact details will be provided at the end of this film. And he talks about how his business is having cash flow problems. The care home staff noticed some unexplained bruising on Annie's arms. He would take my arm and hold it really tight. He'd press his thumbs in, lead me over to my dressing table and make me sign bits of paper and cheques. Though Annie's care home bills were always paid on time, the staff eventually noticed that she had some unexpected financial difficulties. Every Wednesday, the care home would arrange a wheelchair and my friend Christine, her boyfriend, he's 54. Anyway, he had a smile that didn't reach his eyes and it didn't convince me at all, but I couldn't tell her that, could I? Over time, Julia and Neil became Annie's only visitors. Every time they come into my room, he closes the door, quiet, he holds the handle and gently shuts it so no one can hear. And he gives me that smile, the one where his eyes say something else. A care home for the last three years. Anyway, we chose this place, and this was nice, and I moved in. Uh, and, and at first, everybody comes to see you, and that's nice. And it's, it's like you're the queen, and the whole place is buzzing, but of course, naturally, they're busy and they haven't got time to come and see you again. But Julia always came and then she brought Neil. She said he was her boyfriend. Though actors and false identities have been used in the making of this film, the accounts given are based on the lives of real people. I sold my house to pay for the fees and 
I put Julia, my daughter, in charge of my money. She's good at that sort of thing. She's an office manager. Annie is 81. She has lived in